afternoon and welcome to the panel discussion for Dalit writing and issues of marginalization. Can you deny the sunrise? It is my pleasure to welcome our panelists, Dylan Coleman, Janine Lane, Mudna Kuduchinnaswamy, and Sharan Kumar Limbare. The moderator for this session is Mini Krishnan. Dr. Dylan Coleman is of Gugatha First Nation Australian Aboriginal and Greek Ancestry. She lectures in indigenous health at the University of Adelaide in South Australia after completing her PhD there. The creative component of Dr. Coleman's PhD work, Mazen Grace, based on her mother's childhood growing up on Kuniba mission under oppressive colonial government policies, including segregation of the 1940s and the 1950s, was written in Aboriginal uh, English and Gugada language. This won the Australian David Unapon Indigenous Literary Award, was long listed for the Stella Prize and shortlisted for the Commonwealth Book Prize. Janine Lane is Wiradjuri and, is, um, and comes from Southwest New South Wales. A doctorate in literature and Aboriginal representation, she followed a long teaching career at secondary and tertiary level. Formerly a research fellow at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, she currently holds a postdoctoral fellowship at the Australian National University. Her first volume of poetry, Dark Secrets After Dreaming, AD 1887 to 1961, won the Scanlon Prize for Indigenous Poetry from the Australian Poets Union, and her manuscript, Purple Threads, won the David Unapon Award at the Queensland Premier's Literary Awards and is shortlisted for the 2012 Commonwealth Book Prize and the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards. Dalit writer Mudna Kuduchinnaswamy has two master's degrees, one in commerce and the other in the literature of his native language, Kannada. He has published 26 books, five of which are poetry collections. Sharan Kumar Limbari is a Marathi language author, poet, and literary critic. He has spent more than 40 books, but is best known for his autobiographical novel, Akkar Mashi. His book, Towards and Aesthetics of Dalit Literature, is considered an important work on Dalit literature. Mini Krishnan is editor for translations at the Oxford University Press. So far, she has edited 84 full-length translations, five of which have won national prizes for translation. She is a member of Indian Literature Abroad, a Ministry of Culture initiative to promote Indian writers in the six UNESCO languages, served as BAC member, National Translation Mission, and was the founding editor of the South Asia Women Writers website, hosted by the British Council and, and is literary advisor to the Hindu. So now I hand over the stage to uh, Mini Krishnan to moderate the session. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, marginal, marginalized, but not marginal, is, uh, is the theme I'd like to bring forward at this um, discussion. Uh, these were words um, from the Q writer, the Gugi Vatiango, um, who first began writing in English and then switched to his own language. And now people are struggling to translate that back into English. Uh, this is a session on um, some flammable, if not inflammable issues. In some places it's called apartheid writing, apartheid in writing. Um, though we are all bound right now by a culture which is deeply print, print culture, the writers uh, whom we're going to listen to are poets, they are also academics, novelists. Um, they all, uh, their roots and origins are in a culture which is largely an oral culture. Is that correct? And um, our visiting writers from Australia, who have uh, Aboriginal origins, um, are researching their own background, their own languages, um, and documenting the kind of uh, what Dylan said to me. It's almost a cultural genocide. Very slowly, the tide is turning. But even now, there's a lot of uh, oppression, a lot of 
resistance. Um, unlike the blacks who were taken away from coastal Africa and put to work on American plantations here, white populations went to their land, took away their land, took away their culture, tried to erase their memories. So there is a different kind of struggle there. Um, as is well known, the Dalit experience, which can no longer be ignored. Uh, this is writing which, till very recently, was hardly recognized by mainstream. Uh, Atmakate, which is really soul story. Um, it's very casually called autobiography, but it's really writing from the soul, soul stories, as is, I'm sure, uh, what you could hear about indigenous writing. Just, it's, a lot of it is to do with um, w wanting to segregate populations. Just last week, exactly a week ago, in the Hindu, there, on the national page, there was a report from Bikaner how 11 school children were dismissed from school because they drank water, which was, they were Dalit children, and they drank water for, that was meant for non-Dalit children. Their parents were invited to school and asked to sign blank sheets of paper on which the school very coolly typed out, prepared transfer certificates and sent the children out. So if anyone tells you that things are improving, we have to really look at what hasn't improved and what is not reaching newspapers because there are very few Dalits in newsrooms in fact, one of, the big pro one of the big issues is that there is no networked publishing house in India run by Dalits, which is a curious phenomenon. I'd like both of you to comment on that. And I would also ask of you if there's any such initiative there. So marginalized writing, what does it mean? What is its nature? Who are the producers? These are some of the things that we're going to come up with. Um, the nature of this topic cuts so close to the bone because it's about such suffering and ongoing injustice. On the one side, it's endured. On the other side, there's either indifference or even hostility. So we have a vigorous foursome here. Um, I would like to begin with, um, with, with Dylan. Would, what would you like to bring to this discussion? There are, there are people here who would not have read what you've what, uh, read your books, uh, perhaps not watched you on YouTube yet, they will soon. <laughs> so, um, Dylan and Janine, if you, could, um, uh, if you could alternate your remarks and comments and discussions, bring it up, and then I'll see how I can bring in uh, uh, Dalit writers to, to conflate the two experiences. Over to you. Um, hello. Um, firstly, um, I always like to, uh, in our custom, we always acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of this country. Um, when we move through our own country uh, to visit our important cultural sites, uh, we have a custom that we call out to our ancestors, Nali Alden which lets our ancestors know that we're coming. Whenever we move through other people's country, as uh, coming over here on the plane, I always call out to the ancestors of the people whose country I'm coming to and to let them know I'm coming and to thank them. So I thank you um, for inviting us here today um, an enormous privilege um, to be here, so thank you. I suppose um, what's most important to me in terms of um, my writing process is the importance of centering Aboriginal voices. And certainly in working with my mother to record her story and certainly um, working with 
family members in my community to help record that story as well because we have collective stories within our community. It's not an individual who owns that story when it comes to family histories and community. It's a whole community. So in, in this process of um, working with my mother and, and family to write this story, what's been most important is to centre our voices. We come from a history um, of what I would call genocide to begin with, where there was a physical um, extreme um, uh, process, yes, eradication. Um, and after that time, it's continued with cultural genocide, where there were policies introduced. To begin with, there was a policy vacuum um, uh, where these atrocities happened, where there were massacres. Um, and then later, government policies that involved cultural genocide, where um, we were not allowed, we were rounded up and put on missions or stations. We were not allowed to speak our language and we were discouraged from engaging in any of our cultural practices. That, that's why it was so important for me in writing my mum's story to write it in Aboriginal English and our Gugga language because my mother really wanted people to experience what she experienced as a young child and she wanted people to feel what she felt. And so it's been written in first person, Aboriginal English and Gugga. Um, also with a, a glossary at the beginning and people say they find it very difficult to move through those first few chapters and we say this is very deliberate because I'm speaking now in the language of the coloniser um, but here people have to do a bit of work to learn our language before they can move forward with the book and so that's been enormously important. It's about reclaiming our space where we've been pushed to the peripheries, writing even though we come from an oral history is about uh, centering our voices again and writing it in language and recording those cultural practices that continued um, also meant uh, that we centre ourselves and it's a form of cultural revitalisation. This book goes out when we go out to country and we read it around the campfire now and people add to the stories. We speak in language and the children learn so it's become a document of um, revitalising culture and strengthening it. Hi, um, my name is Janine Lane. I would also like to acknowledge um, the traditional people, the traditional owners. Um, I would also like in particular to acknowledge the Dalit writers and to say that I admire your resilience and it is something that I can relate to because Aboriginal people are resilient. And I would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal people who were here, who've come. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge because it's protocol like um, Dylan said, um, I have to acknowledge my people at home because otherwise I wouldn't be here. So I'd like to acknowledge my Wiradjuri ancestors at home. Um, I write poetry and prose and also um, criticism. Um, but today I just want to talk about my poetry and prose. And um, what motivated me to write this was <coughs> the resilience of the women who raised me. Um, and I think that that was something that was always at the forefront of my mind and that I noticed is that Aboriginal women were the custodians of, um, of our culture. And speaking of marginalised and marginalisation, there is a great extent to which our voices were pushed out, as which that Dylan was talking about. But pushed out doesn't mean they were silenced. The voices of women might have been not so much heard in public forums or in places where they needed to be heard until well into the 70s, but it doesn't mean that they weren't heard at home. And one of the things that I tried to emphasise in my poetry, and I call this poetry book Dark Secrets After Dreaming. Dark Secrets, because it represents us as, because we were called dark people, 
It also represents a number of colonial secrets. In particular, one thing I felt strongly about was the sexual abuse of Aboriginal women um, who were placed in domestic service. And there are three generations of Aboriginal women in my family who actually endured th that. And I'm the first generation who didn't. And so I felt very, very, very strongly about the treatment of Aboriginal women in the colonial process, but also the resilience of the women in the process. Um, and the fact that we were not just victims. On the surface, yes, I understand we did look like victims, but we're not just victims. Um, and what comes through really strongly in this poetry is, is the, alternative, the alternative perspectives that the women have on certain takes on Western history. For example, the idea that Australia is a nation founded in peace, because that is just not true. Um, and things like the Federation of Australia as the unification of the country, that is not true. Um, Australia as a worker's paradise, well, it depends what kind of worker you are. And so the poetry actually critiques all those national myths that belong to settlers. And in particular, something I felt really strongly about in the poetry too was a lot of people don't see poetry as history, but I did. I thought poetry is a really important way, particularly for Aboriginal people, of speaking back to, his, to the history that's written us out or written us wrong or has refused to acknowledge us at all. So the poetry actually follows a historical sequence um, of the experience of Wiradjuri women from the campfire to um, through captivity, that's institutionalisation, through colonialism and right up to where I am now. Um, and we didn't lose our culture. There is, that's another thing that I felt really strongly about when I wrote my next work, which was prose, and that was Purple Threads. And that's a collection of episodic stories from the women who raised me. And it has in it um, a tremendous amount of contrast between the outside white world that imposes so many things on Aboriginal people and has so many expectations, but of which some of we were vulnerable if you don't appear to be conforming. So there's that outside life. But then this, this book, Purple Threads, and the purple threads are the symbols of the women in my life. And this book is a real contrast between that outside official um, world where Aboriginal people look like victims or we look like deficits or we look like all of those things and then you suddenly get to come inside my house and you listen to um, my women telling their stories and they're our stories, they're collective, like Dylan said. Um, and you can see this whole other resilient side to the women. You can get a whole different take on Australian history from... And people have said that to me. One of the things that I've really appreciated about people... And this book in particular has been taken up on school curriculums too. And so one of the things I particularly appreciate about this book is ab about that when people come back to me and say they really appreciate the humour in the book because they really admire how at, in the face of such adversity sometimes Aboriginal people can still find the time to laugh and be funny and make other people laugh. So there was the, there was the humour and there was the different take on history that you could actually get from this book and, and then people might start to wonder, Australia as a fair go nation? Come on, not really. Or um, unless you want to have a play on fair, and one of my poems does have a play on fair. Like in the in the um, national settler mythology, they use the term fair as in equal, as in just, as in justice. But you know, one of the things that was really evident in my life was the term fair only applied to fair-skinned people. So and advance Australia fair, which is our national anthem actually warrants a lot further interrogation. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted... That's what my work is about. My work is about the voices that were not there, but that, that, that were not there in the hi official history, but that were always there and that have kept Aboriginal people strong. 
And the fact that I can stand up here <coughs> or sit up here on Dylan um, and other Aboriginal people that you will meet here <coughs> and say, yes, we are Aboriginal people, is just an amazing feat because the colonial government went to a lot of trouble to try and breed us out. There was the genus, there was the physical genocide, there was the cultural genocide. And so if we can stand up here, and, and while I can stand up here and say, my name's Janine and I'm a Wiradjuri Aboriginal, is because of the resilience of Aboriginal women who kept our stories going over that time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. You said, you talked about um, being erased, memories being erased, and uh, the two groups, the white the <laughs> and the Aborigines. Um, one other thing you just said, you say it with pride that you are of this descent. Um, this is also part of the Dalit experience here. Uh, in many places, you know, if you, in many cities particularly, if you say you're Dalit, you may not get a rental space. So uh, in many of the uh, life stories, the autobiographies as they're called, um, Dalits pretend not to be Dalit. They also choose those names that are somehow mask the background. I think Sharon's autobiography, Outcast, has one such incident in it. Um, I'd like to now hand over to our Dalit writers. Uh, before that, just an introductory line which I picked up. It's by Debray, translation from French. Writing collectivizes individual memory, and reading individualizes collective memory. But what if both writing and reading have been withheld or were not part of a community's selfhood? What happens? The continuous rebellions against this kind of power structure, against man's instinct for power to control, is uh, the further, the extension of this session. And um, I'd like to hand over to uh, the other visitor, no, no, the other visitor to Karnataka, <laughs> Sharan Kumar Lambale, who's, um, I don't know if his, the students who are reading his book are here, but the, are you? OK. Uh, his book, Akarmashi, Outcast in English, which I published 11 years ago, has just very recently been prescribed in Christ's College. I'd say a major triumph. For, and I congratulate the people who selected the book. I'd love to know how it's going. And uh, Sharon, you have your student as well as <laughs> general audience to talk to. I said your book is prescribed. And the students are here. Yes, so uh, I'd like you to talk about your experiences and whether, you know, they say that the, the, the Dalit um, writing, Dalit work uh, in the public uh, domain now, so visible, is a great step forward for our society. Uh, how do you view that? Is it a yes and no? Or have things changed even over the last 10 years? Um, We'd like to share, I'd li like you to share some of these ideas and your own um, anticipation and experience of these things, what you think it might be. Two days ago, we went to the We reached at Mar. But we, but Dalit man cannot reach in temple of high caste. I cannot uh, go uh, to fetch water on the veil of high caste. This is the reality. I feel from my childhood that I am not living in one country. I am living in two countries. Dr. Ambedkar said that हमारे देश में दो देश हैं. एक भारत है और दूसरा भयश्रुत भारत है. हर गांव में in every village, there is a marginalized line. Uh, we live outside of the village. 
uh, there are many countries in every village uh, i uh, i this is my very bitter experience last before 10 years i was talking and addressing to my people and i am visiting my communities but after 10 years the uh, situation is changed i am now uh, i am now sitting in front of you in uh, uh, bengaluru literary festival last year murdula chakravarti invited me australia i uh, addressed the in melbourne literary festival and i am addressing mixed group not dalit groups the target is changed that's why my voice is changed my experience is changed ha ah, there is a great acceptance to me to my voice uh, mini krishnan told me that uh, uh, christ university uh, accepted my book for their curriculum but there are 22 universities in the world they accepted my book in their curriculum what is this uh, this is not sharan kumar limbale i am i am talking on behalf of my movement ha uh, i am talking of uh, talking for my people uh, not only uh, men but also women i am talking uh, about atrocities not only dalit women ha uh, kisi bhi jaat ke stri par anyay ho us stri ka jaati ko main nahi dekhta hu anyay hota hai us par main toot padta hu atrocities important ha uh, kis kis किस पर हो ये अन्याय होता है किस पर अन्याय होता है इम्पॉर्टेंट नहीं है जो भी जिसका भी शोषण होता है उसके खिलाफ हम और जुटाएंगे आज मैं दस साल पहले ये महसूस करता था कि केवल इन सिक्सटीन नाइनटीन सिक्सटीन मेरा ये अनुभव था कि केवल हम दलित लोग लड़ रहे थे मगर दस साल में एक माहौल हिंदुस्तान में भारत में बदल बदला हुआ है कि महिलाएं बहुत सशक्त रूप से आगे आ रही है निर्भया के निर्भय के आंदोलन से महिलाएं भी दलित जैसा एजिटेट कर रहा है मुझे एक ऐसा मैं ऐसा लग रहा है कि आगे चलकर विमेन एंड दलित यूनाइट हो जाएंगे दोनों को भी दबा दोनों का भी शोषण हुआ है दोनों पर दोनों पर अट्रोसिटीज हो हो रही है महिला और दलित एक मिलकर फेमिनिज्म एंड दलित दलित एक मंच पर आके कुछ करेंगे तो मुझे लगता है कि नया नई दिशा हमें मिलेगी और एक नया विमर्श उभर कर आएगा आई थिंक देर इज अ स्ट्रॉन्ग पॉसिबिलिटी Uh, thank you sharan i'd also like you to talk about the publishing angle uh, after mr chinsami says something um because this is a literary festival and people want to know about other writers who are you know are you setting up any kind of writerly forum for other dalit writers it's that's something we'd like to um bring but first i'd ha- like to hand over to chinsami a celebrated poet um in fact the oxford anthology of kannada dalit writing which is under preparation has three of chinsami's poems uh my favorite is uh, if i were a tree if i were a tree could you open by quoting the first verse from that and then say whatever it is you wanted to say the just the, just the first four lines if you can you don't remember the english okay All right then let uh, then let me not make you uncomfortable um do say what you'd like to say to bring to this uh, discussion ellarigu namaskara uh, thank you mini for introducing me uh, i think i should uh, start from where sharan has left our experiences are almost similar uh whatever i wanted to say i think yes already i said a few things can you hear uh ambedkar said we are living in two worlds but india lives in many many worlds at the same time that's the peculiarity of uh, caste system 
in fact, one caste experience is not the other caste man's experience. So it's so different. We are living in different worlds. So we are talking of uh, marginalized people. Um, you know, it is uh, it's difficult to explain in a, uh, in a few words uh, the the different uh, uh, the different attitude that the society has towards the least and so-called farmer untouchables. Uh, I would uh, uh, differ with this. Uh, title given to this session as can we deny this sunrise I am not uh, agreeing because we are already in the mid noon the lit literature is uh, uh, can be traced back to 70s and 80s and 90s were the peak even after three decades still the same uh, moment is going on because there is no uh, sign of a new literary moment in the annual, at least in Karnataka. Uh, we, have, we have been writing, and uh, if we include the protest literature, literature uh, the new generation, uh, that's also the Dalit literature. It's, it's offshoot of the Dalit literature. As uh, we have been talking about literature, I want to, I made some notes. I want to say what is Dalit literature. Uh, briefly, a large... Uh, uh, the lit literature could be aptly described as the mouthpiece of the underprivileged and marginalized told in pastoral grandiloquence. This is not the literature for the critics to evaluate at leisure, only to be denied saying there is no art, although it is rich with native metaphors. By and large, the Dalit literature espoused the native si negative side of the social and cultural face of the mother Bharat. So, naturally, it becomes anathema to caste Hindus, who are the chief spokespersons of Indian culture. I therefore feel that there is need for separate Dalit aesthetics for judging Dalit literature. So, there are points, as you already mentioned, uh, the experiences of uh, Dalit is totally different. You know, as uh, my friend said, uh, there is there, a rocket has gone to Mars the other day, but last week, just last week, in Virudhnagar, I can quote this, a 16-year-old bo boy's hand was cut because he was tying a wristwatch. So this is going on even today. And uh, I can quote so many. I have, um, in a government school of Mandi district of Himachal Pradesh, the upper caste students have refused to sit in the same row with Dalit students during the midday meals. This is going on. And in a recent survey conducted in Karnataka, in many schools, the teachers themselves ask the Dalit children to sit separately and assign menial jobs to them, like cleaning toilets. So this list can go on. This list can go on um, endlessly, reflecting the untouchabilities, how brutally and senselessly practiced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just like to interject and ask. So, does this mean that the that there is a great, um, almost voyeuristic interest in the writing, uh, an excitement in sharing um, these stories, uh, like the like Bitra Chandan, uh, the Oriya poet? I'm trying to re recall that line. He says, my poetry is script is lava scripting poetry from my belly. You know, lava from the belly, he called it. So what I, I'd like to ask whether this, while on the one side, there's this curious phenomenon, the writing is doing well. The writing is being accepted. It's even being studied. Though, as you say, the norms cannot yeah, be applied, the usual norms. But that things are really not changing at the ground level. That's one question. And the other is, what do you make of tribal writing? Because that's another group that's also marginalized very powerfully. They are the Adi Vasis, the, the original inhabitants, you know, like the Aboriginals. So there is that group too. Um, we didn't get, I think, a tribal writer for this uh, meeting. But uh, tribal and Dalit writing and those writers and their experiences, 
Oh, really, the next phase. In fact, Anantamurthy once said um, on a speech in JNU, I think I watched him on YouTube, in which he said the future of our literatures really depends on our illiterate communities because they've kept the language alive. I guess it's the same there too. You're reviving uh, an oral culture uh, because the richness, the you know, land, language, culture, it's all deeply connected. And the further we move away from the primary source of all our energy, the land, which is what's happened to all of us living in cities, the further you are away from the real gold, the real force, the real power. So this is some, a question I'd like to ask you. You said the sun has already risen, but then uh, the social realities are so atrocious. Um, is this something? Yes, yeah, say that. You see, my concern is, my concern is, now we have come to the center stage. As Mr. Limbale said, we are addressing our target group has grown. But what is the result? Will there be any change after this? So in spite of all these things, if I can't get a house on rent in a house, if I uh, get bowed down before, uh, you know, without any uh, respect and all that, if there is no perceptible change in the attitude of the people, what is the use of writing so much? And just being, just accepting the writings and say, yes, I am a good writer, I am a recognized per person. Well, I am well placed in the society. What about the mass? In the villages, India is, you know, 70% is still in the village and it is totally caste-bound uh, uh, village, uh, yes, completely. And there is no, um, still the atrocities are there, still uh, humiliation is there, still insults are there. How to overcome those things? So there should, there should be something, basically, a transformation is required. That's what I feel. Thank you. I think education is really the only way. and. Uh school education through uh, perhaps moral value education, peace education. Uh, we have some time for questions, if there's anybody who'd like to ask uh, the writers, or just bring up issues if, if we haven't. I mean, I've deliberately kept away from the political angle, so if anybody wants to say anything. Yes. About, uh, one is uh, Chandraban Prasad talking of uh, going along with uh, globalization and uh, you have to utilize all those facilities what is the uh, what is there in globalization all those things and another uh, uh, dalit interests who speak of uh, dalit aesthetics and uh, dalit uh, uh, their culture rich culture that way so where we have to go whether to move towards uh, with the teaching of uh, chandrapan prasad or uh, towards uh, dalit uh, rich culture where we have to go that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> um, there are so many communities. In Orissa alone, there are 72 Dalit communities. And in uh, Tamil Nadu, equally, I think some 62. Um, I don't know if you've heard of um, Bama's brother, who's written Dalit Panpada. As, so the, the ideologues. Um, in the, uh, amongst the Dalits themselves, they don't agree either. Chandraban really is a journalist. Um, I think Sharan Kumar should take this, this question, what intellectuality, aesthetics, and uh, ideology. You want to say something? Have you heard of Raj Gautaman's book, Dalit Panpada, Raj Gautaman? Okay. अभी तक हम अलग बात कर रहे थे कि अलग होने की कि हमारी अलग पहचान होगी हमारी अलग भाषा होगी हमारा अलग सौंदर्य शास्त्र होगा हम अलग है आपसे हटकर रहे हाँ आप आ, आपकी हमारी दुश्मनी है ऐसी बात ऐसी बात हम चला रहे थे मुझे लगता है कि ये अभी अभी एक फेज बदल गया है मल्टी कल्चर मल्टी लिंगवल ऐसा एक फेज आ रहा है 
और वो बहुत तेज़ी से आ रहा है इसको हम अवॉइड नहीं कर सकते हम कितने दिन तक अलग 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 रह सकते रह सकेंगे कितने दिन तक हट कर रह, रहेंगे ये ये पॉसिबल नहीं है हमें मिलकर रहना होगा मिक्स होकर रहना होगा मिक्स लैंग्वेज बोलना होगा मिक्स कल्चर लेना होगा एनिलेशन इज नॉट परमानेंट थिंग मिक्स कल्चर मिक्स लिविंग इज अ परमानेंट थिंग फॉर इन फ्यूचर मेरी खुद की बात कहता हूँ कि मैं अभी बोल रहा था आपको कि मैं मन, मैं मंदिर में नहीं जा, जा जाता था मगर मे, मेरी जो बेटी बड़ी बेटी है उसका पति हाईकास्ट है हाँ उनका लव मैरिज हो गया हाई का मेरी लड़की अनटचेबल वो हाई कास्ट हिंदू फिर मैं मैंने रिफ्यूज किया कि तू तो हाई कास्ट है मैं मेरी लड़की आपको मुझे आपको देना नहीं है फिर वो मुझे बोलने लगा कि आप इतने बड़े लेखक हैं और ऐसा क्यों जाति की बात कर रहे हैं मुझे आपके लड़की से शादी करनी है फिर हमने उस मेरी पहली लड़की की शादी इंटर कास्ट हो गई आज पंद्रह साल हो गए हैं और बहुत अच्छी चल रही है बाद में मेरा लड़के का शादी आ गया मैं अरेंज मैरिज की और मेरे मेरे विद इन द कास्ट हो गई एक सेम कास्ट मगर वो फेल हो गई दूसरी मेरी लड़की तीसरी मेरी जो लड़की है उसकी शादी अभी उन्नीस अक्टूबर को हो रही है वो इंटर कास्ट हो रही है वो लड़का हाई कास्ट का है वो बोल रहा है कि मैं शादी करना चाहता हूँ मैं बोल रहा हूँ नहीं मेरी पत्नी बोलती है नहीं हम हाईकास्ट को नहीं देंगे मैं बोल रहा हूँ कि हाईकास्ट को देंगे क्योंकि पहली शादी सक्सेस हो गई है और दूसरी लड़के की शादी सक्सेस नहीं हुई है ये थर्ड शादी सक्सेस होगी हम अभी इंटर कास्ट मैरिज करने करने की मैंने अनुमति दी है मेरे पहली लड़की के जो बेटे हैं मेरे घर में आते हैं तो बाबा साहब अम्बेडकर का नाम लेते हैं और उनके घर में जाता है कि वो रामचंद्र शिवसेना ऐसा बात करते हैं कभी कभी मेरे घर में आके शरद पवार की बात बोलते हैं और वो हनुमान की बात बोलते हैं मेरी पत्नी बोलते हैं नहीं 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 यहाँ अम्बेडकर की बात बोलो बुद्ध की बात बोलो उनके घर में जा, जाने के बाद वो अम्बेडकर का फोटो दिखता लेके जाते हैं तो बोलते हैं यहाँ अम्बेडकर नहीं लाने का यहाँ रा, भगवान राम ही होंगे ऐसा बोलते हैं फिर भी उन्होंने और हमने एक्सेप्ट किया है ये कल्चर मिक्स होगा मिक्स रहेंगे मिलजुल के रहेंगे इस दिशा में हमें सोचना होगा लिखना होगा अभी अलग बात नहीं चलेगी ये वक्त की पाबंदी है ये वक्त ऐसा बदल रहा है और उस वक्त को लेकर हमें सोचना चाहेगा इस प्रकार से मंतव्य रखना होगा For his question, uh, you know what Chandrabhan Prasad says: For the self-emancipation, you have to learn English, you have to educate yourself, and then emancipate yourself. That's one part. And the other thing is there is about rich culture of the Dalit. It's uh, it's misleading. There is nothing like rich rich culture of an uh, untouchable. You know, Anant Murthy or the Bettle Puja Yake Kuda do. ಓದಿರ್ಬೋದು ನೀವು ಹಾಗಾದರೆ ಅದನ್ನು ನಮಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಮೇಲೆ ಹೇರಿ ಅವರು ಹೀಗೆ ಇರಲಿ ಅನ್ನೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಅದೊಂದು ಹುನ್ನಾರ ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಸೊ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ವೆರಿ ಕೇರ್ಫುಲ್ ಇನ್ ಚೂಸಿಂಗ್ ಅವರ್ ವೇ ದಿ ದಿ ಗೋಲ್ ಈಸ್ ಟು ಇಮ್ಯಾನ್ಸಿಪೇಟ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ಯೂರ್ಲಿ ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪಾರ್ಧಿ ಟ್ರೈಬ್ ಹೂ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಅ ಡೀಮ್ಡ್ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ ಟ್ರೈಬ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಒಫಿಷಿಯಲಿ ಡಿಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲೈಸ್ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ಟ್ರೀಟೆಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಕ್ರಿಮಿನಲ್ಸ್ uh we put them into a bridge program and into schools uh with great difficulty the schools were not willing to take them but now they are in schools and what we found is that the schools are trying to sort of sanitize them away from their pardiness whether it's language or culture or behavior or even names they're trying to change their names and give them hindu names rather than pardi names um so how do you any of you either the dalit people the tribal people the aboriginal people deal with that where uh, when these children go back home and they come to come back to school after the vacation the teachers say that ye dobara jangli ho gaye hain they 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 regressed into being wild animals again and we work so hard to civilize them how do you deal with that yeah um I can see what you're saying and a lot of my work deals with um the the real gap the real conflict between home culture and school culture because um yeah on the one hand 
I agree that school is necessary for empowerment at this time. Um, but there's a couple of things that I would like to just point out. First of all, just because you're sending a child to a school um, that might be a mainstream school and they may be an Aboriginal child doesn't necessarily mean that you are assimilating them. There could be there. It, there could be a real platform for empowerment there. And also that the child's home culture is really strong. So the school, they're complementing each other rather than one trying to annihilate the other. And that's really important. And as an educationalist, I think that's something I've worked really hard to do in terms of Aboriginal education and people is to, um, is to first of all, expose the potential for a gap between home culture and school culture, which shouldn't exist because then it's a barrier. And then the, the way to break it down is to, <clears throat> in terms of the, this in, in this case, Australian Aboriginal people who will just about always, there are a few exceptions, but just about always be the mon minority in the classroom, that um, it's, it's really important to forget about the curriculum and go through a process of really exposing and making explicit the home culture of that particular minority group in the classroom that it's so that it is valued and it's not strange to other people. Because if you're not an Aboriginal child, the classroom will normalise your experiences. But if you are, it may not. But it doesn't have to be like that. And when you can talk about and introduce things Aboriginal in the classroom and you can talk about um, home culture of Aboriginal people and of non-Aboriginal people that really, without doing that, the learning experience of any um, minority group will never be successful in the classroom. While there's a disconnect between home and school culture, it'll never work. And so if you're an educationalist and you gave some examples of some that sound like it, who want to perpetuate those differences, then you're sabotaging the process and the process of education is not an empowering process as it's meant to be. But if you are an educationalist who is um, particularly for an educationalist from a minority group yourself, and there are a few Aboriginal teachers around, I'm happy to say, um, that if you can actually make that home culture is just as valuable and look just as valuable in the classroom, then you're there for empowerment. And it's also empowering for the non-Aboriginal people in the class to learn about Aboriginal things as well. And while they might be resistant to start with, the amount of people who come back to me, non-Aboriginal people, and say, yeah, gee, I really learnt a lot that I didn't know just from that exposure to Aboriginal history or people or culture or all of the above, is also empowering on the other side as well. And if you can look at that process of reciprocity too, in a colonial situation, it's really, really positive. My question is very interesting. listening to the Australian Aboriginals very much and I think there's a lot to learn from them. So my question is to the Indians that we don't want to see Yeah, we don't want to see a gap between literature, ideology and institutional building. We need to see uh, intelligence here arising and what do you do when there are educational cuts as with the Modi government? Shocking education cuts. So what happens now? Because that is the first problem, that there is no hope, the caste system is well in place with the educational cuts. The second thing is with the idea of the one university, the notion of which a UGC will now represent as an ideological plank on behalf of the Modi government. One university, one window, one admission process, one examination process, one syllabus, one therefore perhaps even uh, the space by which one can see a rural intelligence or a Dalit intel intelligence or obvious intelligence say whatever the nature of a new generation of learners coming into their own this is gone so what, what, how do you respond to okay. uh, very quickly um, whatever laws or whatever uh, rules are put in place I think it really is up to the people we have a teacher in uh, Pondicherry who professor who addressed his student as Kuppe. Kuppe means garbage. Kuppa Swami is his name. He said, why should I call you Swami? 
accordingly, Kuppaswami. So unless there is a transformation from amongst the people, it's like Ambedkar said, it's like building palaces on dung hills. But would you like to answer this question? No. Uh, since it's the Dalits. No. What, what are we going to do with the Modi governments? That's the question she's asked. What is it? I just wanted to um, say, would you like to interrupt? Um, I, I'm also, um, I'm lecturer but in Indigenous Health at the University of Adelaide, but I also engage in research and I've been working with some um, Aboriginal students in the northern suburbs. There's a large population of Aboriginal people in our northern suburbs in Adelaide, in South Australia. And um, centering Aboriginal voices is important, so we use a storyboard so it's an oral communication tool and it's about youth aspirations. What these young students between the ages of 13 and 15 so far, it's gonna go up to 17, have identified is that within the schooling system, racism is a major issue within the institution. Also, in terms of their aspirations, they say it would be good to finish year 12, that's the highest level of our high school, and it would be good to get a job, but they have no idea what they would do. So the institution itself is a barrier because of the racism and it's also um, a barrier because there aren't broader opportunities that these young people and their families see because the unemployment rates are so high because of racism. Um, there are health issues far higher than the non-Indigenous population. So what we're seeking to do in a, in a practical approach is to find out these broad themes centering the youth, the young people's voices, to go and talk with the services and local government to share those stories and to ask what are the pathways for these young people and to talk with the schools as well. So challenging the institutions as well. Um, one thing about cultural genocide is that it sets up, um, there's often a, a group that sets up norms and um, with that, um, there becomes a closed uh, information within these, this group of uh, what they set up as norms and often perpetrated by the media as well and it, and it sets to isolate others so that, you know, the school, uh, the co broader community, uh, the state, national policies isolate. And, so, and the media is, plays a very important role in this as well. So I think important approaches are what we're doing now in terms of speaking out. It's about challenging the school systems uh, as a group so that we challenge those norms as well as all the levels, local government, state, national. And that's certainly what we're doing too in South Australia where we're looking to set up representative assemblies because we had no um, treaty so we have no say, we have no representation in Parliament. So we're looking to set up through the storyboard, which is a culturally appropriate tool, we're looking to set up representative assemblies as well as our own self-government. And it's about addressing these things at an individual level, uh, at a professional level if we work within the education system, but also at a local, state and more broadly, in, in our case, national level as well. And it's linking and building alliances with people internationally like we're doing here. There's a lot of strength, I believe. You know, even with our ancestors, we're all here together. There's a lot of strength in that, in terms of our common histories and us moving forward. There's a lot of strength that's come from today. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, the panelists especially. It's been a very interactive session. I'm sorry this is the end of this session. But please stay put for the next session, which is Kannada Rangabhumi, Gati Stiti, a uh, discussion on Kannada theatre then and now, which will commence uh, very soon. I would like to thank our panelists and our moderator for uh, conducting this session. Uh, this year, the BLF is not simply about the written word. We have at the festival a wonderful showcase of contemporary art and sculpture. Bangalore Literature Festival, in association with our venue and hospitality partner,
Crown Plaza Bengaluru Electronic City proudly presents Forms, Faces, Forces, an exhibition celebrating motives and emotions that books bring alive. Curated and conceptualized by Gallery G, the exhibition is on at the Crown Plaza Hotel Lobby as well as in the festival.